and welcome to what we all should know about carbon pipelines and a look at the impacts on humans and the environment. My name is Peg Vershawn and I'm the Director of Programs at CURE here in Southwestern Minnesota. At CURE, we have spent the last 30 years working at the nexus of climate, energy, water, and rural communities. Uh, when we learned about these newly proposed carbon pipelines, there really wasn't a lot of information available to us outside of what the pipeline companies had on their websites. And we felt strongly that we needed to learn more about the whole liquid CO2 process and what made it different than, um, what makes these carbon pipelines different than other pipeline infrastructure projects that we um, are familiar with. So we're here today and we have invited um, five panelists with various expertise from um, carbon capture to pipelines infrastructure, legal experience around the regulatory process, as well as um, the science uh, and accumulative impacts of CO2 to the human health and the environment. For some of you, pipelines and perhaps even CO2 is not new to you, um, but we know that everyone participating today is gonna to have many more questions after they hear the presentation from our panelists. So, so now that the stage is set, I'm just gonna kind of tell you how we're gonna present. Um, so we've got um, Jane Patton and Nikki Reich from SEAL and um, they're gonna um, set the stage and uh, then June Sakara is gonna come in and talk a little bit about the carbon capture um, process and then Nikki and Jane We'll follow up a little bit. And then we're gonna have Dan uh, Ziegert present. And Dan was pretty very instrumental in reporting the Satarsha, Mississippi rupture. And he's gonna talk about that. And then we are fortunate enough today to have Sandra Steingraber and she is gonna uh, wrap it all up and talk about the accumulative effects and how science and CO2 impact human health and the environment. So that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Jane, and we'll get started. Thanks, Peg. I, as I said in the chat, am very honored uh, to be here to um, discuss this very important issue with everybody today. If there is one thing that you remember from today's presentations, I hope it's that you remember this. This video, shows a rupture of a buried, dense phase carbon dioxide pipeline. The experiment was conducted in the safe environment of the DMVGL Spade Adam Testing and Research Centre to assess the consequences of such ruptures in terms of mass outflow, crater formation and dense gas dispersion. The viewer should note that the extent of the visible plume does not necessarily represent the extent of the dense gas hazard. this video probably dozens of times. This is a test rupture of an eight inch pipeline, of C a CO2 pipeline. When I watch this video, I think about my home in Louisiana, which is another part of the United States where regulators and companies are talking about bringing these CO2 pipelines close to where people live. Um, and this is all done as part of, as you know, the, um, the nation's efforts to move toward a system of carbon capture and storage. But what is carbon capture and storage? I'm sure that you have heard um, a lot about this before. Carbon capture and storage, of course, is the <clears throat> theory that uh, carbon emissions from coal and gas-fired power plants or other industrial polluting facilities can be captured before they're released into the atmosphere and then can be stored underground indefinitely or more often used to get more oil and gas out of the ground through what is called enhanced oil recovery. You might actually recognize carbon capture and storage by another marketing monitor that moniker that it had for decades, which is clean coal. This is not a new technology. 
It's something that the oil, gas, and coal industries have been proposing and working to get public money for, for many decades. And after decades of research and, and uh, experimental application into some form of carbon capture, the flagship projects for this technology have failed in the last few years because carbon capture is just not feasible or economical. Billions of dollars of the public's money have been spent and it is still not working. Less than a tenth of 1%, less than 0.10% of carbon emissions are being captured right now. And feasibly less than 8% of carbon emissions could even be captured if carbon capture and storage is built out in the way that the industry is pushing for. We're talking about potentially trillions of dollars of public money for less than 10% of a solution that endangers communities. And that's if this technology even works. Some project proponents are proposing carbon capture and storage plans, which would affect Minnesota, including a series, a system of pipelines. <clears throat> And that actually includes potentially the largest carbon capture and storage project in the world that would cost billions of dollars with the capacity to capture eight to 12 million tons of CO2 per year. To, that sounds like a lot, millions of tons, but to put that number in perspective, that's only about a 10th of Minnesota's annual emissions. And it's a drop in the bucket compared to the global CO2 emissions annually, which are 36.4 billion tons. That's a lot. <laughs> and what we're talking about is the largest CCS project in the world to address a tiny portion of those emissions. <clears throat> Proponents of carbon capture and storage actually envision a massive new network of CO2 pipelines across the country to transport this dangerous asphyxiant for either enhanced oil recovery in otherwise depleted wells or for storage in, in largely in underground saline aquifers. At present in the United States, there are about 5,000 miles of CO2 pipelines, mostly concentrated in the gas and oil fields of West Texas and mostly used for EOR. And CCS proponents imagine expanding that to 25,000 miles by 2050 and shifting from remote fields to heavily populated areas throughout the country, including Minnesota. And at this point, I'm actually gonna hand it over um, to my colleague, June, who is going to talk about the differences between carbon capture and direct air capture technology um, and, and how both of them actually require the transportation of CO2 from the capture site to the injection site via pipelines. So I'm gonna stop my share and hand it to June and then I will come back in a minute. So I'm gonna do an overview of carbon capture and storage, not specific to capturing from an ethanol facility, but in general. And we can come back to some of the issues with ethanol uh, capture at some point. Um, so I'm gonna start with just sort of carbon capture 101. Uh, and I wanna emphasize here that I'm talking about what we call mechanical industrial chemical mechanical carbon capture, not biological sequestration, which is a whole other topic, of course. So for short, I just call it mechanical carbon capture. There's two kinds. One is, um, there's two kinds of carbon capture and there's three choices for what you do with the CO2 when you've captured it. So the two kinds of capture are, one, you can capture it from sources and two, you pull it out of the air. So in terms of ethanol facilities, we're talking about Point, what they call point source capture. That's what's usually meant when you hear the term CCS. Uh, it, the terminology, by the way, is terrible. There's massive confusion of the terminology um, and different people use it different ways, but CCS <clears throat> generally refers to point source capture, including ethanol <clears throat> facilities. And the other way to, uh, that it's being done is direct air capture. And we're not talking about that today, but they're both mechanical methods that use chemicals to separate out CO2 from the air or from the flue gases coming out of a smokestack. Um, so just to set what's going on in the Midwest in context, this is a list of the current 
DCS operations, carbon capture operations in the US right now, commercial operations right now, and there's only 12 of them. Um, just three of them are ethanol. Uh, and you know, you think you hear a lot, an awful lot about carbon capture these days, but um, there's really not much of it going on because it's too expensive and there hasn't been enough public subsidy, although um, all of these, all of these operations are subsidized from the public by the taxpayer. And I do want to call your uh, attention to the far right hand column there that talks about the maximum capacity per year, a million tons per year. And this is actually all these numbers are from the Global CCS Institute and all I have found are exaggerated. They say what they're supposed to capture, but in, when you read up on them, you find out that they're not capturing anywhere near what, they, what their goal was. But their goal at any rate adds up to a uh, little under 12 million tons a year. Uh, the largest one being with about, uh, I think it was eight, seven or eight uh, million tons a year. And yet uh, in the Midwest, they're, they're saying that they're gonna capture a total of, I guess it's uh, another 20 million per year with the three pipeline endeavors. And you know we'll see if that actually happens. Uh, this is just to point out that um, uh, there's no carbon capture going on at a power plant in the United States today. These are the CCS projects that were that received hundreds of millions of federal funds over the years. They all have been canceled, withdrawn, failed, shuttered. None of them have worked. None of them. The only CCS at a power plant on the planet today is one plant in power plant in Canada, uh, Boundary Dam, it's called, and they are having massive problems and it raised the cost of electricity up there to the customers by about two times at least. Okay, so that's the kinds of carbon capture that there are. Then what do you do with the CO2 once you feed it? There's three choices. You can inject it underground, simply inject it under, not simply, but inject it underground for storage. You can sell it to somebody else as chemical feedstock to supposedly make various things or to use it in fizzy drinks or bio or fuel uh, uh, manufacture, whatever. Or you can sell it for oil extraction in a process called enhanced oil recovery, which Jane mentioned. And as you can see in the right-hand column, this is that same chart with the uh, storage type column in red there, you can see uh, all 95% uh, of the CO2 that's been captured through CCS in the United States has been used to extract more oil. Uh, only one of them, the ethanol facility in Illinois uh, has been burying it uh, and they have had subsidies for that. All of these projects are subsidized uh, by the taxpayer as well. What's enhanced oil recovery? Basically, uh, it, it's, a, it's a way, it's sort of like, I could call it Christ fracking. In, it's a, way, a method in which uh, CO2 is uh, injected ground to sort of spread out the oil that remains in oil wells that have been uh, partially depleted and it squeezes out the rest of the oil that's left. And I recognize that in the case of Summit Navigator, they are now saying they're not going to use the captured CO2 for EOR. In early reports, Summit did indicate that they were considering and perhaps planning or considering to use the CO2 for EOR because there are EOR, EOR oil fields in North Dakota, which is where the captured CO2 is of course headed for. So we don't know. Um, risks and hazards, toxicity. Uh, so I wanna talk just a second here about the toxic chemicals, which is how CO2 is captured. The word captured is uh, nice, but basically it's a chemical process. Um, now this chart, this, this, this slide is what I prepared for, it's a bra for C, CCS, point source capture, and DAC. The last two dot points there, uh, MEA is what is typically used for, is the chemical typically used for capture for CCS, point source capture, uh, and to make it uh, ethylene oxide is used in the production of it. 
I actually don't know the extent to which MEA is used in the production, in the capture of ethanol, in the capture of CO2 from ethanol plants, but um, I haven't read any place that there's an exception for ethanol plant production, but it's something to look into. Um, certainly when toxic, toxic chemicals are used for carbon capture, which is basically how capture is done for the most part, um, there should be, and has not been really, a full life cycle analysis of the toxic risks, including the upstream chemicals production. And then downstream, if you're using these toxic chemicals for capture, what are the residual wastes and where do the, do the wastes go? And there's a literature on that, but it varies by the type of uh, chemical used and uh, a number of other factors. Pipelines, of course, you've all seen this map of the pipelines planned for the Midwest by the three companies that are planning to build them. Uh, and just to reiterate the point that Jane made a few minutes ago, um, CO2, once it's captured, it's a, it's a gas, basically, it's in a gaseous state when it comes out of the air or comes out of uh, smokestacks. It has to then be compressed into a form that's uh, that's most uh, suitable for transport via pipelines. And that is, uh, it is uh, compressed into a supercritical state, uh, meaning a semi-liquid state. And that requires a whole lot more pressure than is required for a natural gas pipeline. So as you can see here, the pressurization required for CO2 transport is far in excess of the pressurization required for natural gas transport. Compressors uh, require a great deal of energy. So there has to be, and in the case of uh, this is a picture of the ADM facility in, in Illinois where they've been capturing ethanol for quite a long time. Uh, they've been using largely uh, natural gas to process their compression, their CCS operation from what I've read. Uh, I'm not sure what they're using now, but that's what they have been using. It takes a great deal of energy to run the compressors to, to compress the, uh, the CO2 into semi-liquid state. And then in some cases, there has to be compressor booster stations to keep the pressurization going. I don't know if there would be compressors required for the pipelines in Minnesota. The need for compressor booster stations, which require additional energy, of course, and means additional uh, facilities that look like this. Uh, the need depends on the um, how long the pipelines are and the uh, diameter of the pipelines, and maybe they won't be required in Minnesota for CO2 pipelines, but I don't know. It's, it's something else to, to look into. Uh, this is just a list. Uh, Dan's going to talk much more about the problems, but I just put this list together of leakage, blowouts, blowouts, et cetera, in the last 10 years. Uh, there was a blowout in um, a storage site uh, in Mississippi in 2011. Workers sent to hospitals back then. There was a bubbling creek uh, because of unpermitted releases of CO2. There was a series of leaks in Wyoming. Uh, there was a school in, in Wyoming that was forced to close and houses evacuated because of leakage of CO2 from a EOR storage site. And then of course the pipeline rupture in, uh, in Mississippi, which Dan will tell us a great deal about. And lastly, I just wanna call your attention to this um, source, uh, which is a Department of Energy, NETL National uh, Energy Lab, uh, uh, a report called Overview of Potential Failure Modes and Effects Associated with CO2 Injection and Storage Operations in Saline Formations. And so this report, this is just some copies of pages from the report, this report does provide information about so-called failure modes and effects. Uh, this is a, uh, a map, uh, a um, a diagram of uh, seismic events, earthquakes associated or possibly associated with the ethanol, with the injection of the CO2 from the ethanol facility in Illinois over the years that it's been operating. And it's not clear whether all of these seismic events are due to that injection and storage, but uh, that's what they were studying here. And this is a diagram of various so-called failure modes of um, and effects of failures of CO2 um, storage pipeline uh, injection and storage. 
So that's what I have uh, for you. And Dan is going to give us a lot more information. Uh, there's my email if uh, any of you would like uh, further information, if I could be helpful. Thank you all. Thank you so much, June, um, for what you the detail that you've shared with us. And as um, we were showing you before we um, cut over to June, um, this network of uh, 25,000 miles of pipeline um, that is planned to be um, built out and installed in the United States uh, by 2050 is on top of an existing network of pipelines. That build out for CO2 pipelines is completely unrealistic. The scientists touting this as a solution expect us to build more infrastructure to move CO2 than we've built to move oil and gas in the last 100 years. And they expect that to be built out in the next 20 years. Existing natural gas pipelines on top of that can't easily just be converted. They can't be converted into CO2 pipelines. And Nikki's going to go into that in a bit more detail um, in just a minute because CO2 has to be moved at extremely high temperature and extremely, I'm sorry, extremely low temperature and extremely high pressure, which means the pipelines need to be thicker and they need to be able to withstand much more pressure and that extreme temperature differential than natural gas pipelines. So what we're talking about is not just a new, a couple of new pipelines, we're talking about a massive new network of pipelines on top of an existing massive network of pipelines just to be able to move CO, CO2 theoretically um, on the public dime. And with that, I'm now gonna um, pass the mic to Nikki and I will continue sharing my screen and um, she will take over the next few slides. So Nikki. Great, thank you very much, and I hope uh, you all can hear me well. Um, my name is Nikki Reich, and I work with Jane at the Center for International Environmental Law. Um, so as, as Jane was just saying, CO2 pipelines are not fossil fuel pipelines. They're not natural gas or oil pipelines. The qualities and characteristics of CO2 and the conditions under which it has to be transported pose unique risks. And these are risks that the current federal and most state regulatory frameworks do not yet address comprehensively. Even the White House's Council on Environmental Quality made these same observations about the fact that there are gaps in the existing regulatory framework at the federal level that need to be addressed. And there are certainly few states that have yet to um, uh, adapt their existing state laws and regulations to accommodate the unique risks. And what is it about CO2 that poses these unique risks. I mean, three of those factors highlighted here are that it is transported in a supercritical state, as has been said, which requires extremely high pressure. That high pressure requires thicker pipelines and different pipeline characteristics um, than those that are used for gas and oil, which is why it's not possible to simply um, convert existing pipeline networks or to assume that the criteria related to the siting of those existing pipelines would be adequate to address um, the, the risks posed by CO2 pipelines. And also crucially, and as we'll hear about more later, CO2 is an asphyxiant and can be fatal at high concentrations. So because there are so few successful CCS projects and so few CO2 pipelines currently operational, the regulatory frameworks are, are for protecting public health and safety and managing the substance are inadequate. And, and there are a lack of uh, studies to date. And, and one WHO expert in fact said that there, the exposure studies simply don't exist. And even industry uh, representatives recognize that given the, the relatively low number of pipelines, failure data is very limited. And so the cumulative experience to date has really impaired the evolution of the regulatory framework. Um, next slide, please. So liquid and uh, compressed CO2 is a hazardous substance, and we really can't stress enough, particularly at the volumes and pressures under discussion in the proposed CO2 pipeline projects here, it should be regulated as such consistent with the classification by the Department of Transportation, um, FEMSA, which lists and classifies um, the gaseous liquid and solid forms of carbon dioxide as hazardous. And unlike oil and gas, uh, the risk with transportation of CO2 at critical and supercritical pressures is not ignition, but asphyxiation. And you'll hear more about this among other impacts from Dr. Seingraber and, and also from Dan Ziegert, who will discuss uh, one of the known instances of a rupture. 
the, the spread of CO2 released from a pipeline can be really quite extensive because of the diameter of these pipelines and the immense pressure, as we saw in that uh, even controlled release video above and recognizing that that was in you know, controlled conditions outside of occupied or used uh, lands. Um, next slide, please. So what adds to the risk posed by CO2 ruptures or running fractures um, are, are that CO2 is a colorless, odorless gas that is denser than air. And so when there is a rupture and it is released, it accumulates in low-lying areas and, and doesn't dissipate quickly, posing a threat to uh, people, wildlife, you know, including first responders who may come to the area. And, it's, and it makes the topography a really important consideration in siting CO2 pipelines, because one needs to understand those uh, dynamics of how uh, a rupture or, or leak could, um, could play out. And you know, when, when these pipelines are sited in rural areas, the, it adds, you know, there these features of CO2 add to the complexity of emergency response. And I'll talk about that in more in just a moment, but when CO2 is released at high concentrations, it not only can have health impacts, but it can actually prevent internal combustion engines from working, which makes evacuation very challenging, and it can make it hard for assistance and emergency help to reach the areas in, in some cases. Um, next slide, please. Uh, I, I, sorry, I just wanted to, before we transfer on, I just wanted to you know, flag something that is often um, raised is that you know, CO2 is compared to, well, it's a, it's a harmless substance. We have it in our fizzy water and our carbonated drinks. But just to really underscore the point that's been made here, when we're talking about a massive pipeline network and system of this scale and volume and pressure, it is a, it is a completely different substance uh, that poses uh, a, range, a range of hazards. So uh, turning, turning to you know, other, other uh, dimensions of the CCS build out that, that could pose or propose CCS build out, I should say, that, that complicate uh, and, and compound the risks of rupture and the health impacts are the potential presence of impurities in the pipeline. So CO2 might not be the only thing in a pipeline. And the, the presence of impurities such as hydrogen uh, sulfide and sulfur dioxide uh, are, are particularly uh, issues when, when the CO2 stream is sourced from power and industrial plants, but there simply aren't enough studies to know whether the presence of those impurities is also an issue at, uh, at fertilizer plants, certainly, and at ethanol um, processing plants as well. It certainly could be. And water, in fact, the presence of water is one of the chief causes of corrosion in pipelines. Um, and as the federal government, uh, as the federal uh, government has recognized in the CUQ's report, federal pipeline safety regulations don't include standards uh, for CO2 composition or purity. So this is a big uh, gap in the existing regulatory framework and there just isn't information about those impurities to answer the question. So this is a key issue for regulators thinking through, um, are these concerns being sufficiently addressed under existing regulations and what guarantees are provided by proponents of, of these projects? Um, next slide, please. So, what role for state regulators uh, with respect to these risks and concerns? There are a number of different ways in which uh, states are called upon to act to protect, uh, to protect public health, to protect the environment, and, and to ensure the enforcement and oversight of safety. So while pipeline safety um, is regulated under uh, DOT, Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration Authority, that has set out uh, different regulations for interstate CO2 pipelines, there is a clear role for the state government, not only in overseeing pipeline siting, including zoning issues, setbacks, and, and the environmental impacts of pipeline, both uh, impacts on surface and subsurface waters in terms of their location and the potential uh, effects of risk, but also in terms of the pipeline permitting processes, the involvement uh, of local government authorities and public participation, and crucially uh, determining what purposes, for what purposes a CO2 pipeline uh, developer may use eminent domain, if at all, to secure land and rights of way for, for CO2 pipelines. With respect to pipeline safety, as I said, uh, you know, enforcement of the minimum safety standards by DOT uh, that DOT has set may fall on state authorities. And, and states like Minnesota can enact more stringent standards pursuant to certification if they have that certification um, from DOT, which I believe Minnesota has for uh, natural gas pipelines. Two other crucial areas of regulation to have on the radar and to really think through the adequacy of existing 
regulations are, as I mentioned, with respect to first responder preparedness, both the resources and funds to respond and the training uh, necessary to do so, which does not exist in most locations and also modes for participation by local governments and the public. And we'll note here that an issue that arises uh, many times is the adequacy of disclosures about plans regarding projects and their, and their locations and risks with affected communities. And critically in Minnesota, where there are populations of, of Native Americans and, and indigenous populations, they need to be at the table and crucially consulted on discussions about CCS pipeline uh, siting. And uh, as, we, as we know, has been an issue in many um, and many pipeline uh, debates. So just to be clear that uh, the federal government does not have authority over the siting of interstate CO2 pipelines across federal and non-federal lands. So states really are in the driver's seat in terms of establishing regulatory frameworks within their state boundaries, which include responsibility, as I said, for siting uh, and permitting those pipelines, as well as segments of uh, interstate hazardous pipelines that are within uh, those boundaries. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and we're, we're getting towards uh, we're, we're getting towards the end here. Um, so one of the crucial questions that the regulations need to consider in establishing uh, appropriate setback distances um, from uh, occupied areas and in buffer zones. And the criteria used for oil and gas pipelines cannot simply be transposed for the reasons we discussed above without um, without tailored analysis. As, as I think will become clear from the example that, um, from the safety video we saw at the beginning, uh, and as from the example of, of the leak in, in Mississippi, ductile running fractures are a primary concern. And so engineering specifications and safety standards are critical to ensure that the pipelines being used um, meet the appropriate tests uh, and have uh, the appropriate ability to withstand the high pressures and, and, and enough checkpoints to, to respond with safety valves. Preventing public safety is really um, a critical issue. And this is going to grow uh, in importance as the plans for build out affect more and more populous areas. So we're no longer talking about pipelines merely in oil and gas uh, uh, exploitation zones. We're talking about pipelines that run in through areas with, with small towns and even close to big cities. Next slide, please. Um, there, you know, if the CO2 uh, moving, um, if, it, excuse me, um, uh, I think, we'll, go ahead, go ahead to the next slide, please, sorry. Um, because uh, the current, you know, it might be the case that current CCS proposals are only involving uh, pipelines running through Minnesota, it's important that regulators consider other aspects of the CCS process beyond transportation, because with the pressure to build out carbon capture and storage uh, across the country, those other dimensions of the carbon capture and storage process may well affect the state. And that includes upstream issues around the capture process, as well as downstream issues around injection and storage. And as June uh, addressed a, a bit ago, the solvents used in the chemical capture process uh, need to be regulated, both their use, transportation, and, and disposal. And the CEQ, uh, again, the Council on Environmental Quality, uh, has mentioned that there has been insufficient study and regulation uh, with regard to the effects of the use of those chemicals on air pollutants and air quality in the vicinity of industrial facilities equipped with capture. So that is another dimension that, that uh, remains under, uh, understudied and under-regulated uh, at the federal level existing um, and also is important for, um, for areas in non-attainment. With regard to injection and, and storage, the, the downstream use of, of the carbon that may be transported through these pipelines, there's, there's a lot of risk with respect to the siting of pipelines, uh, excuse me, the injection of pipeline, uh, pipeline contents into pro in proximity to uh, oil and gas wells or depleted uh, wells. There are lots of risks that doing so, as has been discussed for the destination of pipelines coming from Minnesota into North Dakota, um, even if the proponents disclaim enhanced oil recovery as an objective, there is concern that injecting uh, CO2 in areas of depleted oil and gas could uh, raise uh, issues of affecting the pressure, contamination and leakage, and even um, generating concerns about produced water, which can be radioactive and can require other hazardous management. There's a whole other slew of issues that um, are not currently adequately regulated with regard to ensuring the permanence of storage. Um, there's a lot of promises made that, that the CO2 injected would be stored for millions of years, but the studies just aren't there to prove that that is possible. Um, and there are a lot of concerns about 
the adequacy of uh, monitoring and oversight, particularly when we've seen some states adopt regulations that transfer ownership and with it uh, disclaim liability for oversight and monitoring of injection sites after as little as 10 years um, in, some, in some cases. So we wanted to just bring some of these issues uh, to your attention as you're thinking through um, the, the risks posed by these proposals and the adequacy of existing regulations at the state and federal level to really prevent environmental and health uh, disasters. I'll turn it back to you, Jane. Thanks, Nikki. And we just wanted to close out um, this presentation by pointing out uh, we understand that there have been uh, reassurances given to the people of Minnesota that the carbon that is passing through the state will not be used for enhanced oil recovery. But we just want to reiterate that the over 80% of the CO2 that is captured in the United States is used for enhanced oil recovery. And globally, that number is, it's, uh, other, study, other studies suggest that it's actually over 90% of CO2 collected globally is used for enhanced oil recovery. And the climate justifications for capturing CO2 as any kind of a climate solution depend on the reality of sequestration, permanent sequestration. Um, if there is any possibility that it might leak out at any point in the future, that obviously releases the CO2 into the atmosphere, which is exactly what this technology is meant to avoid. And, and frankly, any justification for CCS evaporates completely if that CO2 is used for enhanced oil recovery. And if the pipelines moving through Minnesota or other states are funded through state or federal climate subsidies, as is often the case, and we understand is the case with some projects coming up in Minnesota, the use of that CO2 for um, enhanced oil recovery could actually jeopardize those subsidies. And if the eventual in injection sites for the CO2 that is moving through Minnesota pipelines are very near existing oil and gas wells, um, we certainly recommend that regulators should be fully investigating what the CO2 will be used for, um, whether it will actually be permanently sequestered, and what guarantees there are that, that, that those storage sites are safe and permanent, as has been claimed. What I want to do is I'm going to sort of squeeze the nozzle down so you're not drinking from a fire hose and you're drinking more from a Dixie cup, okay? Uh, and this is strictly the human reference. This is what happened to a group of people in the United States two years ago on a February evening, on a Saturday night, uh, near the, uh, uh, in the Delta of Mississippi, near uh, the Mississippi River, actually along a little river called the Yazoo River. Um, <clears throat> and these are, this is a small community called Satarsha. Uh, only about 60 to 65 people live in the little village of Satarsha, and then there's a few hundred folks around Satarsha. And the layout of the land is very important here, and, we'll, and, we'll, and we'll, this will echo some of what has been said about characteristics of carbon dioxide. Uh, I call this the gassing of Satarsha because um, this is an event that more than anything else was, was almost like a, a World War I situation where a cloud of gas just rolled over this town. Um, and uh, it starts, let's just start by taking a look. I hope, I'm sorry these images aren't bigger, uh, but um, I'm doing my best here as a um, <clears throat> kind of a Luddite in this uh, uh, advanced business of presenting uh, slideshows and so on on uh, webinars. Uh, um, but this is the little town of Satarsha. Um, you can see all this in my, uh, in my piece on, in HuffPost. At the end, there'll be a, a URL for that. Uh, but this is uh, mostly uh, older folks. Um, this uh, pipeline rupture was an explosion uh, of the pipeline, uh, a, 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 a weld, a cir cir circumference, cir yeah, anyway, a circumference weld, which uh, holds the two pieces of pipeline failed in this explosion. It happened around 7.07 .07 p.m. Uh, on a Saturday night, February 22nd. And this plume of gas descended on the town almost immediately and within four or five minutes, there were about 20, 20 to 25 people uh, who were rendered unconscious by the cloud. That was just, and I'm talking about people who collapsed, fell down uh, at, um, at a, at a uh, cookout that they were attending uh, by the river. Literally, people just fell to the floor unconscious um, wherever they were, in their homes, in their cars, uh, doing whatever they were doing. The 911 calls 
began about 7.13. And I'm going to play you one of those. And uh, uh, again, as Jane said, she hoped that you remembered the, uh, the visuals of the explosion. I hope you remember some of these personal stories. I'm going to play this for you now. Number one. Okay, I am on Highway 433. I just turned off the Tarsha on Highway, off of Highway 3 in yes, Michigan. And it's like a really strong smoke. And I don't know if something's on fire, something's burning. I just like smoke into smoke. And it's like a really strong film coming up. I don't know what's going on. My car stopped. It won't move, and we just got out of the car and started walking because I didn't know if anything was going to explode. I don't know what's going on. But okay, where in on 433 yeah. are you? I'm How on, far from uh, Highway 3? Like, I just signed off Highway 3 probably like two or three minutes ago. About how far? Uh, two or three minutes ago, out from Highway 3, out to uh, Highway 433. Like, I don't know what the fume is. Okay, is it coming from your car or? No, ma'am. It's in the area. Yes, ma'am, can I get your name? Jessica Mason. Is she okay? Who is that? Is she okay? Okay, so uh, can we get a paramedic or something? My okay, friend, what's going on? I, I, she's on the ground. She's laying on the ground. I don't know if she's having a seizure or not. Just a quick, okay. somebody quick. Okay, hold on. Let me put you through to them. Or so she said they're having a seizure. When she, is she, do she have, like, oh my gosh, do we, do we do something like lay her on her back? Like hold on a second. I'm going to put you through to them. Or so it's okay. Okay. Hold on just a second, ma'am. <laughs> Okay, um, just um, if you, uh, if I hope everyone could hear that and uh, that that was clear, but um, let me just get back to my, uh, to my uh, presentation here. Uh, hold on. Okay. Um, so that, that's the sound of, uh, of, uh, of a woman who reported another woman having a seizure. That car broke down it, it, the engine stopped running, uh, as uh, was mentioned, that, that, that sometimes happens. Well, if there's CO2 in the air and there's enough of it, as there was from this rupture, here's the rupture itself. That's what it looked like. Uh, cars are going, all the cars in Satarsha stopped running. Um, people were trying to flee. Their cars died. People jumped out of their cars, and they were overcome, many of them uh, at uh, were those who remain conscious nevertheless had trouble they were disoriented one of the toxic effects here is that you uh, there's a sort of drunken state that uh, people who are under the uh, uh, under the influence of this gas feel uh, it's been described as feeling like you're on a three-day drunk you, you don't you can't, you're not coordinated you can't think clearly people do and say irrational th things and they are incapable of getting themselves out of harm's way, not only because they no longer have a car, but because they simply wander around uh, confused and unable to help themselves. But you can see that this is a huge crater here. This is 40 or 50 feet all the way across. This pipe was completely exposed by explosion. These, uh, this is the frozen area of material that came out well below uh, very, very cold, cold enough to freeze case-hardened steel. Uh, when these uh, kinds of events, when CO2 leaks out in quantity at the enhanced oil recovery site at, a, uh, at an oil field, it, it's so cold that the steel structure of the uh, drilling rig freezes so solid that you can smash it with a sledgehammer into pieces. Uh, that's how cold this is. So that's one quick um, toxic effect right in the area of the pipeline. And then the plume descended, uh, the gaseous cloud, which we call the plume, descended along a creek bed, uh, which was below here. 
and into the town. So it followed the contours of the land. There's very little wind that night and it's settled in the town. Um, I'm just gonna show you again, so that everybody is just, just has a human reference. These are the victims. This is Demers Burns. He was trapped in a car but died only about two or 300 feet from the uh, pipeline uh, when it ruptured that night at about 7.15, he called his mother and said, uh, and sounded confused and agitated and tried to warn her about some sort of a pipeline explosion. Um, about a minute later, uh, he, he, he commented that, oh, our car has just died. And then he was, he him and his two uh, friends, actually relatives, uh, all were unconscious. They woke up four hours later in the hospital and they have had all three of them who were really in that gas for hours have had continuing nonstop health problems of various kinds, including um, uh, difficulty, uh, mental, mental uh, impairment, cognitive difficulties, um, continued breathing problems. Uh, Deamerus here, uh, as you can see, he is, an, is on oxygen. This was two weeks after the event uh, and uh, still having breathing difficulties. I'm not gonna take you through all the stories. This isn't, there isn't time for that, but this is hum just to give you an idea of the variety of people. Deamerus is a young man in his thirties. This is Hugh Martin, uh, who is a, 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 an army vet, a, a man in his uh, late fifties. Uh, he, uh, he collapsed uh, at this uh, 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 picnic that they were having outdoors uh, by the Yazoo River. His mother, uh, he went and rescued his mother. Uh, had to, she was almost unconscious when he reached her in her home, which was just a few blocks away, tossed her in the back of his pickup. And she has had, she never had uh, suffered from any lung issues before. And now she is uh, on inhalers of various kinds. And this is almost two years later. Uh, there are several other people. This is a COPD sufferer who almost died on the way to the hospital. Um, so just to reiterate here, what, what are we looking at? Um, well, as has been uh, already mentioned, uh, when you look at the Navigator Summit or these other pipeline proposals, you need to keep in mind that, uh, you can't say this enough, this is not the bubbles in your soda. It's a dangerous industrial product. It requires public education, training for first responders and healthcare providers and so on. The relevant facts from what happened in Satarsha are, this was, and you may hear some uh, residents here in, in, in Minnesota and Iowa and Nebraska and other places, these were, this was a poor rural community, primarily elderly. And most of these folks, if they did know that it was a CO2 pipeline, they had no idea what that meant. Um, there was no evacuation plan or warning system. Hospitals were uninformed. They didn't know how to treat the victims. They were flooded with people. These two little regional hospitals were completely overwhelmed as more than 200 people were evacuated and almost 50 wound up being hospitalized that night. Uh, although the pipeline company, Denbury, had early knowledge of the leak, they didn't alert people. This is not unusual. It's happened with other pipelines. Uh, where the people on the ground find out that the company knew, but either didn't act quickly or didn't notify them. Uh, 911, as you can hear in that call, really didn't know what the heck it was dealing with. Uh, and they frequently told victims it was a natural gas leak, which didn't help either. Uh, CO2, although we all know what it is, is a little studied hazardous material. I talked to a uh, a, an emergency room specialist who uh, has studied CO2, and I asked him what made him interested in CO2. He said, I, I'm not interested in CO2. He said, no one is interested in CO2. It's not a material that's received a lot of study. There hasn't seemed to be any good reason for it. The World Health Organization told me that, in fact, Satarsha was the first ever mass outdoor exposure to toxic levels of CO2 from an anthropogenic source. So a pipeline accident, first one anywhere. Um, it demonstrated the very limited medical knowledge that we have about human exposure. There really haven't been studies as, as, as someone else has mentioned. And uh, these are some of the symptoms that people have and have continued to have cognitive impairment, reduced lung capacity, depression, PTSD, and fatigue. Um, I'm going to show you an image here that is, uh, I'm going to give you a trigger warning. This is a dead person, uh, but I'm going to talk, I'm going to open this by saying that uh, 
This is not the only CO2 uh, accident. There was a major uh, natural occurrence of a CO2 bubble that came out of a lake in Cameroon in Africa and killed more than 1,700 people in a single night and all the animals that they had in this little series of villages around Lake Nios uh, is the area. Um, this is the, one of the people who died, who just died sleeping. Um, many, many people were found in this condition. Others had managed to crawl out of their homes uh, before they died, and some were unconscious for uh, several hours and survived, but there were only a few dozen of those. Uh, they now have a Lake Nios survivors organization. I urge you to check out their website on Facebook. What do the CO2 pipeline companies believe about CO2? Well, Denbury, which was responsible for the leak in Satarsha, had this to say about Lake Nios. They included this slide, interestingly enough, in a presentation that was basically supposed to show how careful they were being. This is in 2015, uh, how careful they were being with CO2 and that they were doing tests to see what would happen if there was a pipeline rupture. So they staged the pipeline rupture, but none of the results were relevant to what happened in Satarsha, and it grossly understated what happened. Nevertheless, as you can see from this, or I hope you can see from this, uh, in Lake Nios, uh, they took Lake Nios very seriously, seriously enough to, ad to address a conference of oil and gas people uh, and put this into that presentation that, that it killed 1,700 people. And noting here at the bottom, all living things within 15 miles around the crater were killed. Um, so let, if you, if, you know, if we're, if we're talking on a, on a sort of common sense level about what hazardous is, uh, I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding how anyone could have a serious question about whether carbon dioxide is hazardous, but I'll give you a few more reasons. CO2 has long been used for uh, the euthanization of lab animals and other animals, but humane society and international bodies have, have now believed that death by CO2 is too painful and distressful to the animal. And here's a quote from a, a paper that was published uh, on this issue by a veterinary group, uh, Leach et al. concluded that CO2, either alone or in combination with argon, cannot be used humanely at any concentration and is therefore unacceptable as a euthanasia agent for laboratory rodents, particularly when more humane methods exist. So that's, how, that's the, uh, the science as it applies to lab animals. I hope sincerely that we give ourselves as a species a bit more consideration. Um, uh, there's been, though you, you're going to hear if you haven't already from Summit and Navigator and other companies that their CO2 is pure and that they're, they're, they won't face the problems that uh, some, uh, for instance, EOR operations have where it may be contaminated with hydrogen sulfide and other chemicals. And this is simply a myth. Uh, CO2 is inherently hazardous. There are regulatory loopholes, unfortunately. Um, OSHA classifies CO2 as a hazardous material. You will see, I have a brief couple of, uh, of slides on this, but uh, uh, Sandra will go into more depth on this. But all the CO2 industry material safety data sheets have a pretty frightening list uh, of, um, uh, of uh, effects from CO2. The existing regulatory regime by the relevant federal agencies is, in, is inadequate, largely because there's been so little uh, pipelining of CO2. Uh, there's only the 5,000 miles compared to 2.6 uh, million miles of natural gas and oil pipelines. So it's a it's a it's a it's a gnat really uh, on the on the body of a of, of a much bigger enterprise here. Uh, we've talked about the much higher pressures, which makes it much more dangerous. Here are those CO2 material safety data sheets warning that. Uh, it can cause rapid suffocation. Uh, it can increase reps, respiration and heart rate, nervous system damage, frostbite, as you saw from that slide where the freezing cold material came out. Uh, here is a graduated chart of what happens at different co concentrations, beginning with headaches and confusion and ending uh, with uh, 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 unconsciousness, seizures, and death. Um, about 100 people die every year 
uh, from uh, basically interacting with CO2 in forms such as the carbon dioxide that's used in bars uh, or restaurants to force uh, your, your various uh, mixers and uh, uh, soft drinks uh, out of the spigots uh, at the bar. Um, so we, we have the 100 people a year who die from accidental inhalation of pure CO2 in those applications. We have the Lake Nile situation. Now we have a, a warning, to what seems like a warning to me, uh, from something that can happen in a populated area in the United States. Uh, the, the already uh, mentioned the, the classification by OSHA. Uh, and this is very important is the, the limited amount of information we have about toxic effects from sublethal exposure to CO2. In other words, people like the people in Satarsha, some of whom were in that cloud for anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour or more and, and survived, but have all sorts of symptoms, some of which um, are really a kind of first of its kind uh, study uh, uh, in, in, in demonstrating what happens to people who, um, who, who, uh, who survive a CO2 incident uh, but are really never the same. Uh, you're going to hear the industry just, you know, poo-poo this and so on. I have to tell you that if they have studies that show differently, uh, I would like to see them because uh, two years of studying this have not revealed any of those. Car engines don't only, don't sometimes die. In a situation like uh, Satarsha, all the engines died and they were, some of those cars were, they were scattered over the landscape the next day, their doors open, windows smashed where uh, emergency responders went in to rescue the victims and so on. So it was a real, a real uh, ca catastrophic event for this little community. Um, here, here again, the lack of knowledge. Um, in the US, we have all this experience, uh, 30 years of experience um, with CO2 uh, pipelines. Uh, but we have very little you know, information on what happens when they break. And here's my uh, my uh, my uh, uh, emergency room expert talking about the very small amount of literature. So the, most of the other things uh, in terms of the pipeline network and what the impacts would be have been covered. I will just say this, this is from the Congressional Research Service and this is their prediction, which is that if the nation's CO2 pipeline network expands significantly to support CCS, and if this expansion includes more pipelines near populated areas, we're going to see more accidents. That is an absolute certainty. Um, there's a lot of things we can do, but creating a more robust regulatory structure at the federal level and certainly at the state level where a lot of these uh, pipelines are now originating is an, is an absolute must. And this is me uh, and my organization. And uh, this is the, uh, uh, the, URL, the URL for my HuffPost uh, investigation, which I urge you to read. And thank you, it's been an honor to be here and speak to you. So thank you, Dan. Um, before we go on to Sandra, I just thought it would be helpful to put this into context of what we know about what's going on in Minnesota related to these projects. Um, currently, um, the first and the largest project is called Midwest Carbon Express, and it's being proposed by Summit Carbon Solutions out of Ames, Iowa. And if you go to their website, they tote that this is gonna be the world's largest uh, in, uh, infrastructure, carbon pipeline infrastructure in the world. It's a five state interstate project, just under 2000 miles um, covering Minnesota, Iowa, Nebraska, and South Dakota. And it ultimately, as was referenced earlier, will end up being sequestered in North Dakota, just east of the Bakken fields and east of the Missouri River as well. Um, just yes, our, we received uh, even notice this week that Summit did a presentation earlier this week to the Minnesota Rural Energy Board because they're shopping an RGU um, as we speak. Um, they are moving quickly and fast and they're trying to get as much done before they're on the radar of all of you. Um, as a strategy to move their project forward. The second project proposed in Minnesota is called the Heartland Greenway Carbon Pipeline. And this is by Navigator CO2 Ventures located in Texas. 
This carbon pipeline is rough, roughly about 1,200 miles through Nebraska, Iowa, Minnesota, South Dakota, ultimately ending up in Illinois for sequestering. This pipeline just had public meeting in Martin County just like within the last couple of weeks since the first of the year. They're a little bit further behind uh, Summit, but nonetheless, they are, are moving quickly. And just two weeks ago, we uh, saw a press release from Archer Daniel Midland that they've contracted or signed a letter of intent with a company out of Denver called Wolf Carbon Solutions for a 350 mile carbon pipeline that will again begin somewhere I'm guessing in Western Iowa. And uh, there's speculation um, based on what was said at the Minnesota Rural Energy Board meeting earlier this week that the Marshall ADM facility will um, feed into that particular pipeline. But again, it's very early in the process and we don't know. The companies have been really um, very, um, not very transparent. Um, they uh, haven't given a lot of information. Um, they've done public meetings. Summit has done public meetings in Minnesota. So the Summit Pipeline Project will have three lateral branches in Minnesota. There's a shorter branch that starts in Fergus Falls at the ethanol plant and goes uh, west to, uh, to meet the main trunk in Aberdeen. Then there's another um, small lateral branch that um, hits an ethanol plant in the um, Jackson County and goes down to uh, Illinois, as you can see um, on the map. And then the largest lateral branch starts in Granite Falls at Granite Falls Energy ethanol plant and goes south. Um, initially, this uh, summit project uh, is targeting approximately 30, I don't know, I've heard 33, 36 ethanol plants. But in their public presentations, they've also talked about fertilizer companies also um, adding on. And so they'll say that the carbon uh, capture process in the ethanol uh, facilities is a pure CO2, as was referenced earlier, and we don't know if that's true or not. But certainly, if they're going to be working with fertilizer companies, we know there'll be other additives in, in the mix. And so we are just suspect of what they're giving us in the public meetings. And I have been to meetings in Granite Falls, Redwood Falls, and T South Dakota, as well as participation in um, viewing other ones that were recorded. And they change their information in all of them. And so if you at some point are working with them in your process, or maybe some of you have already begun working with them, I would encourage you to verify all their information because it, it seems to be changing um, from meeting to meeting. And so I think that's important for you to do. Okay. Well, good afternoon. I'm Sandra Steingraber. I'm a PhD biologist who studies environmental health. And I serve as a senior scientist with the Science and Environmental Health Network, where um, carbon capture and storage is part of my portfolio. Uh, oil and gas extraction has been the focus of my research for the past 10 years. Uh, and as such, I'm the co-principal of the um, Fracking Science Compendium, which will be released in a few weeks in the eighth edition. So I'm delighted to be part of this briefing and share what I know with you. Um, and this gathering is especially meaningful to me because although my PhD is from the University of Michigan, I actually conducted my dissertation research at the Lake Itasca Biological Station up in the Mississippi headwaters. And I feel quite passionate about the task of pre protecting the air, water and forests of Minnesota and the public health of the people who live here. And as your final speaker, I'm not going to present any more PowerPoint slides as I'd like to transition us into an interactive conversation. So I'll be describing some data rather than showing you charts and graphs. And I'm not gonna start off um, with pipelines or ethanol distilleries, um, but actually inside our bodies, and then we'll work our way out. So uh, I invite you all to take a breath and then exhale. And with that inhalation, you just swept into the alveoli of your lungs, a pint of the Earth's atmosphere, um, which is two measuring cups full of air, 20% of which is oxygen that's now headed to all of your cells, um, specifically to the mitochondria inside those cells, where through the miracle of the Krebs cycle, to remind you of an eighth grade biology class you had long ago, energy is being extracted from the food you ate in a process called metabolism. 
And all that oxygen, of course, uh, comes from the world's plants, where through the miracle of photosynthesis, food is created and oxygen is produced as a waste product. More specifically, about half the oxygen in the air we breathe comes from trees on land and the other half from plankton in the ocean. So if you take one breath, you can thank the trees for that uh, gulp of oxygen. And then the next breath is um, thanks to uh, the plankton uh, who are drifting around on the surface of the sea. So in turn, then we of course breathe out carbon dioxide as a waste product of our metabolism. And that CO2 is taken out by the plants in a kind of active communion that allows them to keep on photosynthesizing and keep giving us oxygen. So I wanna point out first that we have chemoreceptors in our carotid arteries that run up our neck and also in, in the medulla oblongata, which is the brainstem in the back of our heads. And those chemoreceptors are constantly monitoring our body's levels of both oxygen and carbon dioxide. And, they're, and we're monitoring that, those levels very tightly, both in our bloodstream and in our spinal fluid. And we actually have two separate systems to do this, one for CO2 and the other for oxygen, and they operate independently of each other. And that's because it's not enough for us to get sufficient oxygen. We also have to expel carbon dioxide because whenever carbon dioxide is dissolved in water and we're, all of us are 65% water by weight, um, that CO2 will turn into carbonic acid and that increases the acidity of the fluid around and inside of all of our cells. So increasing acidity caused by CO2 buildup in our bloodstream, that's called acidosis. And it's the reason actually that we sometimes just sigh deeply in the middle of our afternoon. Um, sighing is actually triggered by um, rising levels of CO2 and low, lowered pH, which is what happens when things become acidified, right? And so as acidosis starts, our first body's response is to sigh deeply. And that, um, because CO2 buildup in our bodies, um, starts to trigger acidosis and that's a powerful stimulant to breathe. So I'm going on about this because I wanna put a fine point on the idea that although carbon dioxide is yes, a natural molecule that we all are making uh, just by living, it's also a powerful human toxicant and a cellular poison. The reason we breathe faster when we're exercising is not only to get more oxygen inside our metabolizing cells, but to expel all the building up of CO2 so it doesn't basically just dissolve us. And consequently, and rightly so, carbon dioxide, um, as has been pointed out by uh, Dan and others today, is on the hazardous uh, right to know substance list as recognized by a host of federal agencies. You heard about the Occupational Health and Safety Administration, but also the Department of Transportation and the National Institute for Occupational Health and Safety, Safety and Health. And these agencies recognize that CO2 is a hazardous substance, not only because it's inherently toxic by this mechanism of acidosis that I've just described to you, but also because pure CO2 is one and a half times heavier than ambient air. And if it's released into the air, it will settle near the ground and displace oxygen. You've heard that uh, phenomenon already today too. So, and that, that makes it different, for example, than other hazardous air pollutants, um, let's say like gasoline vapors, which will rise and, and dissipate in, in open air. So that means that CO2 acts as an asphyxiant and can create respiratory arrest, unconsciousness and suffocation within a minute of exposure. Because not only is it uh, serving as an acid inside of our bodies, um, but also because it's gonna stay on the ground, it pushes the oxygen out. So it, it exposes us to high levels of CO2, but it doesn't allow us to get oxygen in. So in, by both mechanisms, it harms us. And furthermore, in the, in the seconds before asphyxiation sets in, CO2 acts as an intoxicant, as, as Dan has so um, eloquently described. It creates lethargy, confusion, and disorientation. And this phenomenon of CO2 intoxication really matters when considering the risk of fatalities because it prevents those who are exposed to CO2 from recognizing that they're in danger and fleeing the area. In the words of a two, 2017 review of the medical literature on carbon dioxide poisoning, fatality rates are so high from CO2 exposure in part because, and I'm quoting now, victims of accidental 
carbon dioxide intoxication often do not act to resolve the situation. They just can't escape. So if quick rescue is achieved and carbon dioxide toxicity from severely high exposures don't kill victims outright, um, we don't know much about what happens after that. And, and again, Dan put a great um, point to this. Um, it's known that those who survive have problems that are more than transient, including harm to the brain that extends to personality changes and loss of vision. But the data on this are very slim. And whether this damage is caused through the phenomenon of acidosis or by some other mechanism, we don't actually know. So I spent quite a lot of time this week in preparation for this presentation, reading fact sheets and guidelines from various federal and state agencies for how to rescue and administer first aid to victims of CO2 poisoning. And from that research are a couple of things I wanna point out. First of all, on a lot of these fact sheets, um, they list you know CO2, which is the chemical name, carbon dioxide. And then the synonym next to that is dry ice which of course is what we call the solid form of carbon dioxide. But that detail listing dry ice on these fact sheets <clears throat> um, as a synonym for CO2 re reflects a bigger truth. Um, namely, what we know about the deaths from carbon dioxide poisoning and how um, people exposed to high levels of CO2 um, are harmed, they, they mostly come from occupational studies with workers confined to indoor spaces exposed as uh, to dry ice, um, or in some cases, as Dan mentioned, um, car carbonated beverages as in a, 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 in a bar or a restaurant, or in some cases, even fermentation processes um, like silos or um, winemaking, or CO2 as a byproduct. So first responders are therefore encouraged in these all of these um, fact sheets and guidelines from various state and federal agencies that I looked at. First responders are encouraged to remove victims from the area as quickly as possible because of it, you know, CO2 is like putting chloroform over your nose. It, the, the time between when you feel disoriented and unable to um, act, act to remedy the situation and when you completely collapse is very slight, like sometimes as short as a minute. So first responders are encouraged to get people out of the area as quickly as possible and, and at the same time take care that they themselves are not overcome in the rescue process. And in the words of one of these fact sheets for first responders, it says, quote, take precautions to ensure your own safety before attempting rescue. So here's where we need to point out that all of this advice assumes that the people who have collapsed are few in number and they're in a small confined space somewhere, um, almost certainly a workspace and they just need to be dragged out of there. And so the, these guidelines are completely irrelevant and difficult to, um, to kind of uh, repurpose in the situation of a carbon dioxide pipeline rupture in an entire community, which raises the risk that the internal combustion engine of your ambulance is going to sputter and stall because the same high levels of dioxin that are blanketing the, the whole area and pushing out all the oxygen, right? that are down at the ground level. Um, that oxygen is also needed by spark plugs to make vehicles be able to conduct evacuations. And, and we don't, there's just no guidelines for first responders about this that I could find. The public health literature on carbon dioxide poisoning also mentions another source of possible poisoning. And again, this is um, what you just heard a little bit about from Dan, and, and it goes by the name Massive Geothermal Emission Events. And basically the only one we have good records on is this one that took place in Cameroon in 1986 when 1700 people died along with every living thing in a 15 mile radius after a massive release of carbon dioxide gas came out of a lake. It's a volcanic crater lake called Lake Nyos. So that's the kind of one case study that we have. Um, to my knowledge, public health guideline protocols um, don't take those kind of scenarios into a, a account and are intended for small confined workplaces. I could not find any vetted guidelines or best practices for emergency room personnel or first responders for how to handle these so-called massive geothermal emission events from human caused things like a breached CO2 pipeline. The story that we have out of Yazoo County, um, Mississippi is essentially it um, and and, and those folks are kind of the canaries in the coal mine 
for this massive expansion of um, CO2 pipelines that's now been proposed. Um, and I want to underscore an earlier point by Nikki as well that um, there's just no comprehensive regulatory framework for looking at community risks to uh, in which a carbon dioxide pipeline is, is traversing that community. And the, the closest analogy that I can come to in all my work with environmental health is what uh, is another Minnesota example, actually, when the county of Winona County, Minnesota, um, decided to ban silica sand mining for frac sand. And you might remember that story. Um, in fact, it was just um, last, uh, I think last June, May or June of this year of 2021, when the Supreme Court um, refused to hear the case brought by the sand mining company that was attempting to overturn uh, Winona County's ban, which had been upheld by the Minnesota Supreme Court. And the reason I think that this is like kind of the only analogy you have to think how to think about CO2 is that silica sand, like carbon dioxide, is a uh, terrible um, cellular poison and silica uh, lodges deep in the lungs and creates silicosis. But the only data we have about the dangers and exposures of people to silica, silica dust come from workers because only people that work with, uh, you know, jackhammering uh, cement and concrete or glass blowers um, have ever been exposed. We've never, until frac sand mining, exposed entire communities of people, not just um, young, healthy workers who are working an eight hour day, but pregnant women, um, children, elderly, people with COPD and other disabilities and so on. And so there, there was no data to, to tell us what a safe level exposure was or how to, how to prevent exposures, how to help people and so on. And, and the industry tried to argue that absence of data equals absence of, of harm. Um, but that's not what the um, county government in Winona decided. Um, and uh, anyway, they have banned that practice, rightfully so. It's a great example of um, the precautionary principle in action. If, it's, we, if we know that silica is a known cause of, of cancer and silicosis in workers, there's no reason to believe it, it wouldn't have the same effect in a four-year-old. So with that kind of argument, um, Winona County, Minnesota banned the mining of, of silica sand for fracking um, for industrial purposes, and that ban has been upheld. So I refer you to that. That was a good decision on the part of um, the elected officials of Winona County. All right, so the CO2 guidelines that we have, like the silica sand guidelines, presuppose that victims are adult workers. We don't have any data on what happens when a pipeline breaches and fills the air up with toxic levels of CO2. Uh, how does it affect pregnant women, children, the elderly, disabled members of the general public? In Minnesota, the fact sheet from your own state health department on carbon dioxide toxicity and safety standards, which I did take a look at, cites the Minnesota Department of Labor Industry for how much carbon dioxide a healthy adult can safely be exposed to over an eight hour work shift. And the Minnesota Health Department of Health guidelines make clear that these standards for CO2 exposure, and I'm quoting now, were developed for healthy working adults and may not be appropriate for sensitive populations such as children and the elderly. And then still quoting, MDH is not aware of lower standards developed for the general public that would be protective of sensitive individuals. In other words, we don't know what levels of CO2 are safe for people who are not workers in an industry working an eight hour shift. All right, so I wanna move out of um, the human body now and talk about these CO2 pipelines. Um, do we know that the pipelines carrying the carbon dioxide are safe for the communities they traverse? No, we do not. And there are reasons to think otherwise. And, and one of them comes from the, this explosive um, potential of CO2. And I just want to put a little finer point on that. You saw the picture um, of the, the, um, the crater that was formed in Mississippi and all of the kind of frozen um, stuff all around it. And I just want to remind us all why that is, right? So when 
CO2 is carried in a pipeline. It has to be compressed and put under really high pressure to, to change it from a gas to this kind of sort of pseudo liquid. It's a kind of sort of super critical um, thing that flows. Um, and um, whenever you do a phase change, you change the temperature. The reason we can cool off when we sweat is that um, the sweat is a liquid that comes to the surface of our skin, but to actually have a cooling power, it needs to evaporate, which is why when it's humid, we drip and we don't evaporate and then we don't cool off. But when there's a phase change between liquid water turning into a vapor, that uh, causes things to cool down. That just happens when you change things from a solid to a liquid and from a liquid to a gas. So if a pipeline should breach and liquid CO2 comes spurting out, a couple of things happen. One, um, it all of a sudden expands rapidly in a kind of um, thing that can resemble kind of an explosion um, as it's now not under high pressure. But the other thing is it's gonna move really rapidly from a liquid, the supercritical liquid into a gas and that makes things super cold cold enough, as you heard, that you could just smash steel with a hammer, but also, and this is another health, health and safety hazard for the people in these communities, anyone close to the pipeline can be, uh, is at risk of frostbite and just, and just becoming frozen. Um, and then secondly, um, is uh, to recall that when in the presence of moisture, carbon dioxide turns into carbonic acid. And we, as we said in our bodies, that triggers a process called acidosis. In pipelines, of course, it's called corrosion. And to be transported in pipelines, CO2 must be carried as this liquid. And that's a state that carbon dioxide does not typically assume. And again, this liquefaction is created through immense pressure. And if there's any moisture present in the pipeline or in the processing equipment or in the CO2 itself, that um, the CO2 will then acidify, turn into carbonic acid and can eat holes through steel, um, which necessitates these special chrome lined pipes for its transport. So now you've heard the story of the town of Satarsha, Mississippi, where in February 2020, after days of heavy rain, a CO2 pipeline ruptured and spewed this CO2 cloud throughout the community, sending 40 some people to the hospital, and some of whom were found, as you saw and heard, foaming at the mouth in their stalled cars and they were overcome while trying to escape. So the question is, can pipelines of any kind be engineered so that accidents like that never happen again? with no corrosion, no leaks, no catastrophic failures at any point in its life cycle and at any point in the spider web of thousands of miles of these pipelines. I don't know of any examples where that has ever happened. And I believe for Minnesota, the, um, the story of Enbridge Line 3 is the cautionary tale here. All right, so then to, um, to wrap it up, I wanna say that Article 1, Section 1 of your own state constitution the Minnesota State Constitution Bill of Rights opens by saying, um, government is instituted for the security, benefit, and protection of people in whom all political power is inherent. Um, and I would, um, I'm asking, well, let me back up one more time. I want to, because I want to end with this historical anecdote. Um, Henry Rowe Schoolcraft is officially credited by the state of Minnesota for discovering the headwaters of the Mississippi River that happened in 1832. And that would be Lake Itasca where I did my field work for six years. But he was not the only explorer to make that claim. Other expeditions led by other white men assisted by bands of native people made rival self-serving claims declaring other nearby lakes the true head of the waters and they contested Schoolcraft's claim. And during that time, fraud, plagiarism and social unrest was growing because there was form and fate for fame and fortune to be made by seizing the prize of naming the headwaters of the Mississippi River after oneself. But the simmering conflict was not in the public interest. The Minnesota state legislature stepped in. Um, it had enough um, and it passed a resolution valorizing the claim of Lake Itasca as the source of the Mississippi. And I'm quoting now from what the state legislature said in 1832, quote, so that the, its earliest explorers not be robbed of their just laurels and to remove temptations to adventurers in, in the future to gain notoriety by attaching their name to said lakes. And by that mechanism, school cross challengers were dethroned by the state government, peace reigned, and Lake Itasca is still called Mississippi's headwaters. 
So I'm asking you to do something similar. In 1832, the Minnesota state government did not have absolute hydrological proof for which of several lakes was the true source of the Mississippi River, but they did need to settle a socially destabilizing and dangerously escalating conflict among competing profiteers. They needed to govern in a precautionary way, and you can do that too. So to close with the words of your own state constitution, governments is instituted for the security benefit and protection of the people. Your job is to ensure that the security benefit and protection of the people of New York means, of the people of Minnesota means that the, the, that responsibility says you must deny um, this dangerous risk field pipeline project, which operates basically as a hazardous waste sewer for the fossil fuel industry. And, um, and the direct benefit does not go to people, but to the fossil fuel industry and uh, preventing all that from going forward, I think um, is now in your hands. Thanks.